Welcome to Leadership Reimagined, where game-changing conversations are reshaping the world of work. I'm Janice Elleg, CEO and founder of Elleg Group, executive search advisors, pioneers in redefining executive search through our unwavering commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Today on Leadership Reimagined, our topic is leadership and growth in a purpose-driven culture. And I am delighted to welcome Kevin Lobos, chair and CEO of Stryker. Kevin serves as the fifth chair and CEO at Stryker since it was founded in 1941 by Dr. Homer Stryker, an orthopedic surgeon. Stryker is a leading medical technology company with over 50,000 employees globally. Born in India, Kevin grew up and attended McGill in Canada and has lived and worked in four countries and four industries. Prior to Stryker, he held executive positions at Johnson & Johnson, and he is a member of ADVA, MED, the Business Council, and active with community boards. Kevin, welcome in a very busy world that you're living in and driving this incredible company. I'm delighted you could join us today. Thank you, Janice. It's a pleasure to be here with you. So we first met in 2021 when you attended the New York Women's Forum Breakfast of Corporate Champions as an honored company for your representation of women on boards. You have a highly diverse board. With the addition of a new board member in May, you will have 50% women. Why have women and diversity overall been important to your business? Yeah, thanks, Janice. We're really excited about the milestone of 50% of our directors being women. We've been unwavering in our commitment to DEI, and we continue to invest in a strong talent offense that really focuses on an inclusive culture where we look to attract and retain great talent with all kinds of different backgrounds and demographics. Uh, the business case for diversity, as you know, is very well established. But in our own experience, what we've seen over the last 10 years is um, as we become more diverse, it is correlating with better business performance. So we have our own personal experience. And as we get more diverse, our business is performing better. Yeah. And, you know, I've always said you're really representing your employees, your customers, your communities, and your investors. So the diversity makes a big difference in that milieu of who you're serving. Absolutely. So your mission statement is, is, and I quote, together with our customers, we are driven to make healthcare better. Describe the word driven as it applies in Stride Striker, where you're looking for low ego and high humility in your culture. Yeah, look, our purpose is a key part of our culture. You can actually feel it in the company. Our teams are inspired to help their customers and the patients that they serve, and, and we are intensely customer focused as an organization. The people that succeed at Stryker, they value each other, they play to their strengths, they care for each other, and they collaborate to win. So people with high egos just don't do well at Stryker. We really focus on team-based results. That's really what matters. And what I often say is that if you're in a corporate role at Stryker, and that includes me as the CEO, we are in the selling business, not the telling business. And what I mean by that is you know, we have to sell all of our employees on why we want to launch a new initiative. Uh, we just can't tell them. They just won't blindly follow our instructions because they're really focused on what's best for their customers, what's best for their business. So that kind of selling mindset is really important, and you can't lead with position power at this company. So in your divisions, they really own and have the power of, of driving the products in, into the customers. Is that right? That's correct. What, what I like to say is that the divisions and the businesses of Stryker are the center of gravity. That, that's, and everybody else is at the service of the divisions to help enable their success. Including you. <laughs> Including me. I have to sell. I have to tell them why something is valuable. And if they don't believe me, or if I, I ask them just to tell me, why not? Uh, and, and not just ignore me, but, but they really have the, uh, the trump card to be able to, to do the things that they need to do. And that's just a different, it's a different kind of organization. A lot of people who, if you come from the outside and you're in a corporate function, you're used to just saying, do this initiative. Uh, it won't be met with, uh, with acceptance unless they're sold on the benefits of why. But once they get on board, uh, we really execute extremely well. Stryker has an unusual model. You are highly decentralized, where each division is fully integrated company with many functions, including R&D, that reports to the division manager and the president. So with an aggressive M&A strategy that you had in place and a high bar for success, 
what are the benefits of having each deal truly owned by that division? And how does that highly decentralized organization work in practice while you still have a strong culture and collaboration? Well, it starts with the mission and values are the uniting force of the entire organization. So that's one thing that's common. But then each division has their own personality and they are held accountable to deliver against the business model. Uh, we're very tough on that. So if they put forward a deal and they have a business model, they have to actually deliver against that. And every summer we show the board of directors a, a list and a dashboard of all the deals that we've done. And the deals are very largely successful. Uh, we've had a really good track record. They're very close to their customers and they have a good sense of what products should they build versus what products should they buy uh, because of that intimacy with sales and marketing and R&D all working closely together with their customers. And so that's a model where even business development resources are all embedded in the businesses. We only have a very small corporate team, usually two, two to three people, and all the other people that are doing deals are all embedded in the businesses. So it is a very unique model, but it's a model that's serving us very well. That, that's that's terrific, and I want to learn more about that. So but you became CEO in 2012, and you instilled four company guiding themes. What were they, and how has that focus really led to success and what changed over the years with pandemics and other situations in the market? Yeah. So first, the company strategy statement is to drive market leading growth and category leadership in our business segments. So that's sort of the overall strategy, which is very clear. We're growth oriented. <clears throat> we're driving for category leadership. The four pillars, the first one's customer focus, then innovation, then globalization, and lastly, financial performance. And those four pillars are supported by a foundation based on talent and high quality products and services. And over the last 10 years, the pillars really haven't changed much. They've been very consistent. We already talked about the intense customer focus of the innovation, which includes both internal innovation as well as acquisitions. Globalization is a huge opportunity still for Stryker. Over 70% of our sales are still based in the U.S. And then financial performance being a very uh, accountable, driven company. We are driven to perform. Everybody likes to have a number at Stryker and to chase their numbers. But over time, we've added some uh, descriptors within the pillars to talk about areas like corporate responsibility, where we have a, a bigger focus now than we did, let's say, 10 years ago. And since 2012, your revenues under your leadership have doubled to over $20 billion in sales, right? Now in 2023, going into 2024. And you've had over 60 acquisitions, which is an incredible number. So M&A has been a key driver of growth uh, at Stryker, but has it been accelerated under your leadership and why and how did you do that? What, what, what was your driver to ha really have more M&A under your leadership? Yeah, we've made a step change in, um, in acquisitions uh, since I took over as CEO. And there was a couple of reasons for it. So the first was we had an incredibly strong balance sheet. And if you think back to 2013, uh, interest rates were very, very low. So it made sense to be able to use up that balance sheet to, with very, very low interest rates to be able to go out and do acquisitions. The, the second reason is these decentralized business units were so highly successful commercializing that it made sense to feed them with technologies, you know, whether those technologies were internally developed or, or whether they were done through acquisition. And what we focused on is uh, technologies that are growing faster than Stryker's growth rate. And so what that does is in the second year after integration, it then lifts the overall growth pro profile of our company. And we've gotten into segments that are that have more attractive uh, end market growth. And, and that's why our organic growth, if you go back to 2013, it was about 4%. And it's been a steady climb, whereas in 2023, our organic growth was 11.5% as a company. So it's been a very consistent contributor to our growth formula, we, we are now considered a serial acquirer of companies and technologies with over 60 deals in the last 10 years. And uh, we are going to continue this formula because it's serving us very, very well. Well, that's a lot to absorb and integrate and make successful. But I understand the first deal uh, for you as CEO of Stryker was Mako, a robotic application in surgeries. And many of your surgeons were not favorably inclined 
and these were your top and tough customers. So your your stock actually fell 5% the day you announced the deal, and customers loudly criticized the deal. However, as I under, read about this, Mako's acquisition makes Stryker today the clear leader in robotic-assisted surgeries. And in the U.S., 60% of knee replacements are done by the Mako robot. And you've said in past interviews that, quote, you have to listen with one ear to the investors and customers. You can't listen with both ears. Well, in listening with your one ear, Kevin, <laughs> you made a calculated success story out of where you were highly criticized. You made a tough call. And CEOs always have to make tough calls. The buck stops with you. So how did you know that or did you not, but you thought it was a calculated great risk to take in doing this? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this was a controversial deal without question. Uh, not only did our customers not like it, our own sales forces uh, were not really so excited about it. Uh, investors, as you mentioned, uh, did not uh, treat that very well with the big drop in the stock initially. Uh, but really, for us, we just looked to, to really del delight our customers and deliver better experience. And the, what we knew is that 25% of knee patients were not satisfied with their knees. And we felt that the, the knee application, the total knee application was the killer application. And it felt like a call to action. We have to find a way to have these patients be more happy with their outcome. It just felt like a bet worth taking since it had the potential to transform the industry. And it was one of those deals that had what I told our board at the time, just enormous upside that would likely last for a decade. And we've now celebrated our 10 year anniversary of the deal. And what we see is that Mako is, uh, still has the potential to keep us in the lead on robotics for another decade. And we are now adding spine and shoulder applications and things that we really frankly didn't even think about 10 years ago. We have a very strong balance sheet. So we could afford to take the risk. And if you wanna win, you just have to be willing to take risks. But it was really rooted in knowing that uh, we can make these procedures easier to do for a surgeon, more predictable, more consistent, give them better information. And the, the idea of the one ear with the customers is sometimes the customer doesn't really know what they need, right? And the, and the, the idea of robotics was uh, very polarizing. And, and so you, you listen to what concerns they had, what issues they had, but, but sometimes they, they don't, until they see it and experience it, they don't really understand the, the value that it's been given. So most customers didn't like it at all. Our, our, like you say, our best surgeons were, uh, were not so favorably inclined until they actually got their hands on it, until they watched a surgery, until they, they had a lab where they could actually experience it. Then the light bulb started to go off. And, and that's like that even for us, if you think about our lives with new technology, sometimes it, it seems daunting, it seems potentially unnecessary until you experience it. So. Uh, it's obviously turned out to be a, a, a spectacular acquisition. If you think about the total knee, when we first bought it, it didn't have a total knee application. So we only launched that in 2017 uh, because they had initially had just a partial knee and a, and a total hip application. And just since 2017, now 60% of these knees, of our knees are done on the robot. So the adoption rate has far exceeded my uh, expectations. It's just been, uh, just been a terrific deal. That's a great success story, you know, and particularly as your first deal as CEO, <laughs> it could, could have gone the other way, but, and knee replacements now are so common. So you're taking this to other parts of the body as well, correct? Absolutely. So initially it was partial knee, then it was hip, uh, and then total knee. And now we're going to do spine in the third quarter of this year, and then shoulder at the end of the year. And then beyond that, we, we plan to do revision hip uh, and revision knee. So we are going to stay very busy with more and more and more applications. And, and at the same time, you're still acquiring other companies. Of course. We have, yeah. uh, we have a lot of businesses, I, as I say, a lot of mouths to feed. So the businesses are all hungry for, for different technologies. And we have a, a diverse set of businesses, if you include beds and stretchers and surgical equipment and stroke products for the brain, external defibrillators, as I mentioned. So a very, very broad group of products and, and musculoskeletal uh, needs from foot and ankle all the way to cranial uh, implants. So it's a very diverse set of businesses. And the beauty of being decentralized is that you can have two or three deals going on at the same time. And those, those integrations can occur because you have separate teams that are 
focused on those integrations. Um, obviously not large deals at the same time, but we, we often have multiple integrations going on at the same time. And you, when you're looking at deals, you seek to be number one in that product area, right? Whether it's a defibrillator or something else in the, say, the ambulances. And We don't have to be number one, Janice. What I would tell you is we need to be a category leader. Okay. So you've got to be number one, number two. You could maybe be number three if, if it's a consolidated market. But yes, we want to be number one, number two. We have to be very meaningful. Uh, the customer has to sort of uh, make sure that if we're in a category, they're thinking about Striker. They want to buy from Striker. And in most of our categories, we are number one. Uh, but sometimes we're number two. And then there's one or two that we're number three. But but we're very, very meaningfully ahead of the, the people below us. And so, yeah, that's the goal. And it wasn't the case. If you go back 12 years ago, there was a number of categories where we weren't the leader. And through acquisitions and organic growth, we've now become leaders in every segment where we play. Yeah, so you've really stick, stick to your core in each of the divisions to be in that leader category. So let's talk about your leadership style. Uh, you're the first person in your family to go to college, and you've said your parents could never have imagined that you would one day be CEO of a U.S. company. So what were some of those drivers and lessons that landed you in the CEO seat? Because I'm sure there are many who are listening would like to know how they might get into that corner office as you're in today? Well, look, growing up as a second generation immigrant in Canada, uh, it's not something I ever imagined that I would be the CEO of an American company. Um, but I knew I liked business. Uh, I liked leading people. And just from there, I, I just had a series of uh, lucky breaks and also very good fortune of having some leaders champion me to take on challenging assignments, including my first move to the United States in 1997 another boss that uh, that promoted me to Paris and London for, for different jobs, and then, and then a, a boss that encouraged me to shift into medical devices because I was in chemicals and consumer products and other industries before that. The luck uh, certainly was part of it, and, and that really had to do with jobs opening kind of sooner than expected and then having people tap me on the shoulder and say, I, you know, I know it's only been a short time that you've been in this job, but are you ready for this this next big job? And Obviously, I have a very, a very wonderful wife that was willing to move with me across these four different countries uh, and, and raise our kids. So that's also, uh, you know, it's not easy. But, uh, and I had to take some risks, right? So when you, when you take these change industries and you take these jobs in different countries or different locations, there's always an element of risk that's involved. But, uh, but I would say it's not something that I charted out and, and was uh, actively pursuing. I, I just I sort of kept moving ahead, wanting to learn wanting to develop and um, and these opportunities just kind of came along and it, it so it's not a traditional path that uh, that i followed most of the medical device ceos started in sales and marketing and have spent their entire career in medical devices whereas uh, i started in finance and i was in other industries and so it's uh it's a little bit unconventional the path but i but i always loved business and and i've just had some you know terrific bosses that uh, tolerated my questioning and uh, and we're able to give me chances. And, and then uh, obviously, if quite a few lucky breaks, luck obviously plays a role as well. But you also were there when opportunity knocked. And I think that goes a little bit to what I've heard about you on your YouTube videos and in multiple interviews uh, on being a leader and your intense focus, as you mentioned before, on customers, but also, secondly, your intellectual curiosity and wanting to know more. And so that's some of it, you know, in terms of you switching uh, functional areas and careers comes to that intellectual curiosity, which really stands out uh, in terms of how you've progressed. And also what I've read about is you want a questioning culture. You want people to question what's going on. And so you are constantly questioning and that you're encouraging them to. And then you're hiring people who are high drivers with high humility and low ego. So each of these in terms of what makes you stand out as a leader, could each be a podcast on their own. But just talk a little bit about that intense focus on the customers, your intellectual curiosity, and the people that you look to hire uh, into Striker with that high humility, low ego, and high driving. Yeah, listen, the high drive, low ego formula, it, it's really critical for us um, it, being a performance-oriented company where results matter, but where results are, are team-based, not um, for individual glory. What we most celebrate at Striker are team victories. Um, and having a low ego means what? That people listen more. They all challenge more. 
and they're also willing to change their ideas. They don't get stubborn as a leader. They don't uh, think that their idea has to win. At, at Stryker, we always want the best idea to, to win, not your idea. And, and that kind of continuous learning and improvement mindset, that helps ensure that we don't get complacent. Uh, even as we have success, we, we never want to stop listening, stop looking at new ways of doing things, uh, being willing to challenge and change things. Because as soon as you start to get complacent, that's, that's when you start to lose. And so I've always been very curious, very uh, open to new ideas. I'll be willing to change my mind. And, uh, and I want that throughout the company. I want people who are going to challenge their leaders and challenge their peers, but, but not, not just to try to one-up each other. It's not, we don't want internal competition. We just want to get to the best answer. And, and it, you know, the danger of high drive is sometimes people with high drive come with high ego <laughs> because their ego is what drives them. And, and we really try to filter and try to find those people that are mission driven you know, think about things like ex-military people we have and a lot of people who've, you know, played college sports as an example. Those are just a couple. And we obviously have very diverse uh, places that we hire from, but we tend to like people who are, are focused on the mission, not individual glory, and and who are, are very open-minded and willing to, to sacrifice for the team, but also change, you know, change people's thinkings and challenge. So it's a, it's, a, it's not easy uh, it, I'm not saying we're perfect in all parts of our company, but that's absolutely what we strive for. And so that's what you're looking for, the screen of, in terms of when you're bringing people on board. And with 60,000, 50,000 employees, that's not easy, but I guess you're, you're looking for your leaders to be sure that they're bringing on the right people into your culture, because that's what makes your culture strong. That's right. And then role, and I obviously try to role model those behaviors, as, does, as do my uh, leadership team members. And, and I really do believe we're, we're getting there. We've made a lot of progress in this area. And, and as I said before, the high ego people just, they realize it's not going to work and you should either self-select out or, or we have to move them out. Um, so it's really important that you have the right talent, but they have to fit the culture. Yeah, you know, I think what I really have to admire you for is the questioning culture at all levels, because sometimes that frontline worker knows more. <laughs> than, Oftentimes than the person, they know more. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and so you want them to question because at the end of the day, it's all for the benefit of the customer, which is your patient, the patients, right? And healthcare in this country. So uh, questioning cultures are not common. And so I really commend you for that because I think it's a, it's something that more companies need to do and the end result will be best for all constituents. Yeah. Like what we'd like to say, Janice, is it's sort of a kind of a reverse pyramid is the way we're structured with meaning that the sales force is the tip of the spear they the relationship with the customer and then everybody else lines up behind them to help them be successful uh, versus having a top-down sort of orientation this decentralized model and that's why it's not for everybody there's people that come to striker and it's like this is this is just too hard <laughs> if you're in a corporate <laughs> function you know you just have to spend so much time selling as i mentioned yeah. You just, even if it's obvious and it seems like this, you should just do this, just do yeah. it. It's no, it takes longer. It's so it's not always easy, but, but it's the model that works best for us. And, and tends, we tend to get to the best answer that way. Uh, it's not always the most efficient, but, but it definitely works. Well, and you've said one of the most important lessons you've learned as CEO is to be patient. <laughs> so, you know, that, uh, you need to be, and I quote, very firm in with where the company is going, but very flexible in how we get there. So uh, as, a C as a CEO and with other leaders um, who report to you, how does this play out every day in terms of what you and others have learned to be a patient leader? Yeah, listen, as a person, I would tell you patience is not a natural strength for me. Mm -hmm. but, but what I've learned over time is that pacing change is critical to success in a large organization. So even if you have the right change initiatives, if you go too fast or you go too slow, it, it can really take the company off course. Uh, you can miss a window, or if you change too fast, you, you can derail the, the, the organization. And it takes you a long time to get back on, on course. So what I've learned is sometimes I might have the right idea of where, uh, certainly of where we're going and be pretty clear about that. But the teams on the ground know better about uh, how fast we can move and they're closer to the action. And so I do listen to them and, and sometimes, you know, they tell me the timeline, it's, it's longer than I'd like, but, 
it's better to me when I do a change initiative, I want to make sure that it that we don't have to go backwards so that the change sticks as you implement it, even if it takes a little bit longer. And frankly, they've been right. When we changed our organizational model, uh, our operating model to have Europe uh, report to our division presidents directly on a solid line, that was a big change. And, and they slowed down the change versus what I initially imagined. And they were 100% right. We were, we were not ready uh, to rush into that change. And by, by taking our time and doing it very diligently, uh, we've now had a, a thriving European business that's been growing high single digit, low double digit since 2017. And, and that was a major change from the growth profile we had before. So, so that's what I mean by being patient is, uh, it's just making sure that the organization can absorb the change and then also not having too many initiatives right. at the same time. So I understand uh, Stryker has an FDA approved commercial products that utilize AI. Can you tell us about them and what you envision for Stryker in the future to stay ahead of the curve as an industry leader and using AI? Yeah, listen, AI is an exciting uh, new technology that's uh, going to improve all of our offerings, I think, over time. Uh, we have two FDA-approved products right now. One is Blueprint, uh, which is pre-planning for sh uh, shoulder surgery. And what that does is you take a CT scan, and then the image is loaded into through our AI model, and then the, the AI model actually produces a surgical plan for the surgeon that tells the surgeon whether you should do a short stem, whether you should do stemless, whether you should do a reverse shoulder or an anatomic. So there's multiple different shoulder uh, options and it provides the plan based on the AI algorithm. And the surgeons absolutely love it because it's using the best data available to give them a, a clear plan of what's gonna be best uh, for that patient. And that again is FDA approved. We have another product. Actually, there's two versions of the product. So we have three commercial products, but, but the second uh, feature that we have is quantifying blood loss. So after uh, birth or after surgery, we have uh, an AI algorithm that reads the, the blood on the sponges and in the canister and computes the hemoglobin, which today is just sort of a visual inspection and kind of guesswork. This brings science to that using AI to actually quantify the hemoglobin so that you know whether you need a transfusion for the patient or, or whether you don't. And again, that's FDA approved. We've also now stood up a whole new organization that we call Digital Robotics and Enabling Technology, uh, which is loaded with uh, AI engineers. And they are now meeting with each one of our divisions and developing a portfolio of opportunities that, that we plan to, to add in the future. So extremely exciting uh, what this can do to, to really bring better science and better predictive algorithms, uh, better results for patients, and, and obviously for our customers. So you see much more happening in terms of Stryker using AI uh, in its development of products? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that we'll stay tuned for that. That's going to be very exciting. Yeah, that's right. I'm not ready to tell you about those new future yeah. products yet, but, okay. <laughs> but, but they're coming. <laughs> All right. Uh, so you're uh, unusual in another respect, in which I admire, is that you really encourage your team to sit on outside boards, hospital boards, even more local boards, not necessarily in, in the industry. So w what what does your team bring back to the organization that you play such value on, on them uh, spending their time in those organizations? Well, I think there's a lot of benefits for uh, board for board experience. Uh, you get external perspectives. You get to build networks. Um, you learn new practices. And even if it's in another industry, you, you learn different things. Being on a hospital board, I'm on a hospital board, and a couple of our other uh, leaders are on hospital boards, and, and that's our customers. So you really learn a much more a deep appreciation for for our customers um, and also on community boards, I think it's really important that uh, that we give back to our communities. And one of the ways to give back is, is to be active uh, on community boards. But I, I, I do believe it helps our leaders have an external perspective uh, because sometimes you get con so consumed with your job and your company that you you sometimes just aren't thinking as broadly uh, as you as you should be. And so uh, with this uh, participation on external boards and also even just networks. So we have different uh, organizations that we're a part of. You, you mentioned AdvaMed, that's a trade association, but there's also MDMA, there's the Healthcare Leadership Consortium. And so we have a number of these organizations that I want our people involved in so that they're seeing good ideas from anywhere, from other industries, from other organizations, and also that they're giving back to their communities. So Kevin Lobo, Chair and CEO of Stryker, 
Uh, any parting words for our audience? Uh, listen, thanks, Janice. Uh, it's just an honor to be the, the CEO of this company. We had an incredible year in 2023, and we're going to continue to innovate. Uh, we're going to continue to grow and, and impact the lives of millions of people around the world. I'm incredibly grateful to our employees who live our mission and values and serve our customers each and every day. Well, I'm, I really must commend you on all you're doing with all the products and the M&A activity that's going on because it, you really are going to change the planet and healthcare for so many individuals uh, worldwide. And uh, I don't yet need a knee replacement or anything, but, but I'm glad you're working on all of these innovative products, really, which will help so many people. So, Kevin, to you and your team, thank you so much. And thank you today for this incredible um, journey into learning more about Stryker. And we will stay tuned for more updates from you. Yes, thank you very much for inviting me. And thank you to our audience for tuning in to another game-changing conversation on Leadership Reimagined. You can find me on LinkedIn, Instagram, or visit our website at ellagroup.com. Thank you all for joining us today.